Priscilla and the Wimps by Richard Peck. Listen, there was a time when you couldn't even go to the restroom around this school without a pass. And I'm not talking about those little pink tickets made out by some teacher. I'm talking about a pass that costs anywhere up to a buck sold by Monk Clutter. Not that a mighty monk ever touched money, not in public. The gang he ran, which ran the school for him, was his collection agency. They were Clutter's Cobras, a name spelled out in nail heads on six well-known black plastic windbreakers. Monk's threads were more subtle. A pile-lined suede battle jacket with lizard skin flaps over tailored Levi's and a pair of ostrich skin boots, brassed toed and suitable for kicking people around. One of his cobras did nothing all day but walk a half step behind Monk, carrying a fitted bag with Monk's gym shoes, a roll of restroom passes, a cash box, and a switchblade that Monk gave himself manicures with at lunch over at the cobra's table. Speaking of lunch, there were a few cases of advanced malnutrition among the newer kids. The ones who were a little slow in handing over a cut of their lunch money and were therefore barred from the cafeteria. Monk ran a tight ship. I admit it, I'm five foot five and when the cobra slithered by, with or without Monk, I shrank. And I admit this too, I paid up on a regular basis. And I might add, so would you. This school was old Monk's Garden of Eden. Unfortunately for him, there was a serpent in it. The reason Monk didn't recognize trouble when it was staring him in the face is that the serpent in the Cobra's Eden was a girl. Practically every guy in school could show you his scars. Fang marks from Cobras, you might say, and they were all highly visible in the shower room. Lumps, lacerations, blue bruises, you name it. But girls usually got off with a warning. Except there was this one girl named Priscilla Roseberry. Picture a girl named Priscilla Roseberry, and you'll be light years off. Priscilla was, hands down, the largest student in our particular institution of learning. I'm not talking fat, I'm talking big, even beautiful, in a bionic way. Priscilla wasn't inclined towards crime. Otherwise, she could have put together a gang that would turn Clutter's Cobras into garter snakes. Priscilla was basically a loner, except she had one friend, a little guy named Melvin Detweiler. You talk about the odd couple. Melvin's one of the smallest guys above midget status ever seen. A really nice guy, but, you know, little. They even had lockers next to each other, in the same bank as mine. I don't know what they had going. I'm not saying this was a romance. After all, people deserve their privacy. Priscilla was sort of above everything, if you pardon a pun, and very calm, as only the very big can be. If there was anybody who didn't notice Clutter's Cobras, it was Priscilla. Until one winter day after school, when we were all grabbing our coats out of our lockers and hurrying, since Clutter's Cobras made sweeps of the halls for after-school shakedowns. Anyway, up to Melvin's locker swaggers one of the Cobras. Never mind his name, gang members don't need names. They've got group identity. He reaches down and grabs little Melvin by the neck and slams his head against his locker door. The sound of skull against steel rippled all the way down the locker row, speeding the crowds on their way. Okay, let's see your pass, snarls the cobra. A pass for what this time, Melvin asks, probably still dazed. Let's call it a pass for very short people, says the cobra. A dwarf tax. He wheezes a little cobra chuckle at his own wittiness. And already he's reaching for Melvin's wallet with the hand that isn't circling Melvin's windpipe. All this time, of course, Melvin and the cobra are standing in Priscilla's big shadow. She's taking her time, shoving her books into her locker and pulling on a very large sized coat. Then, quicker than the eye, she brings the side of her enormous hand down in a chop that breaks the cobra's hold on Melvin's throat. You could hear a pin drop in that hallway. Nobody's ever laid a finger on a cobra, let alone a hand the size of Priscilla's. Then Priscilla, who hardly ever says anything to anybody except Melvin, says to the cobra, Who's your leader, wimp? This 
practically blows the cobra away. First, he's chopped by a girl, and now she's acting like she doesn't know Monk Clutter, the head honcho of the world. He's so amazed, he tells her, Monk Clutter. Never heard of him, Priscilla mentions. Send him to see me. The cobra just backs away from her like the whole situation is too big for him, which it is. Pretty soon, Monk himself slides up. He jerks his head once and his cobras slither off down the hall. He's going to handle this interesting case personally. Who is it around here doesn't know Monk Clutter? He's standing inches from Priscilla. But since he'd have to look up at her, he doesn't. Never heard of him, says Priscilla. Monk's not happy with this answer. But by now, he's spotted Melvin, who's grown smaller in spite of himself. Monk breaks his own rule by reaching for Melvin with his own hand. Kid, he says, you're going to have to educate your girlfriend. His hands never quite make it to Melvin. In a move of pure poetry, Priscilla has Monk in a hammerlock. His neck's popping like gunfire and his head's bowed under the immense weight of her forearm. His suede jacket's peeling back, showing pile. Priscilla's behind him in another easy motion, and with a single mighty thrust forward, Frog marches Monk into her own locker. It's incredible. His ostrich skin boots click once in the air, and suddenly he's gone, neatly wedged into the locker. A perfect fit. Priscilla bangs the door shut, twirls the lock, and strolls out of school. Melvin goes with her, of course, trotting along below her shoulder. The last stragglers leave quietly. Well, this is where fate, an even bigger force than Priscilla, steps in. It snows all that night, a blizzard. The whole town ice is up, and school closes for a week. <laughs>